Coming up on Theatre Talk. Somebody said about Les Liaisons Dangereuses, if you read this book, you know it, the so society can't go on like this. Exactly, exactly. It's heading towards the edge of a cliff. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. <laughs> Tonight I am going to tell you a story which is real, but what do we mean by that? All stories are real. October 20th, 1969. From New York City, this is Theatre Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Uh, now Susan, there is a terrific, I don't know what, if I call it a, a play, uh, I guess you call it a great theatrical experience on Broadway now. The Encounter at the Golden Theatre, it's uh, conceived, starring, brilliantly put together, by one of the theater's great geniuses, Simon McBurney, who joins us on Theater Talk. We've been fans of yours for many years, and it's the first time we've met. Well, thank you for having me. What would you call it? Yeah, what would you call your piece? <laughs> I would call it a play, uh, but I would also call it a story, mm -hmm. because it uses perhaps the oldest form of theater, which is very simply telling a story. Um, but it does it in a way which I think is probably completely unexpected. So it's, it's a combination of a, of a play, but also a, a radio show, a podcast I've heard it compared to. You're, you're taking us on this journey. Yes, I would say that it's really not like radio and certainly yes, not Yes, that's like an a, old form. A, a, not like a podcast. No. Why should we think that it's like radio? Well, because one of the things is that the form of it is that the story begins, and I, I, I begin to relate this, uh, the journey of this man, Lauren McIntyre, who was a photographer in 1969, getting lost in the jungle. And you hear my voice telling that story for more than 25 years. And gradually, his voice starts to sort of chop into it. So what you see is a process of me becoming him, and in the end, I become him totally, but he himself begins to sort of fall apart and become unhinged in a way that you can only understand when you see the piece. Mm -hmm. And that is the story. It's almost the story of someone being taken apart. All their assumptions about the way that they live, what they think the world is like, even what time the, is. Yeah, even down to the point he asks himself, is our conception of time this thing that we think of in our watches, is that r real or is that just a story that we've made up? So what is the initial situation that's pushing him towards being unhinged? In 1969, Lauren McIntyre, photographer with National Geographic, and he's a very remarkable man and there is a whole archive of his work in Washington, was, uh, he asked National Geographic if he could prove the source, find the source of the Amazon. They said, that's not very photogenic, but we have heard about these people called the Mairuna, who were thought to be disappeared, extinct. They're coming out of the forest. Get us photos, and then we will fund your expedition. He's dropped into the Amazon completely alone, and he makes contact. <laughs> but he wants his photographs, and he gets so far in the jungle that he has no way of getting back, because he doesn't speak their language. They don't speak his. And of course, they are in a situation where they are fleeing the colonial approach, mm -hmm. where they are fleeing uh, oil men, rubber tappers. The loggers. white man is a threat to them. Huge, huge, any intruders. And so he's in a, a perilous situation, but also he's in a self-imposed situation. He went in, if you like, you could say committing a crime. He wanted to take photographs. He wanted something from them for his own good. Yeah. One of the things that happens is he loses his camera. Yes. So he loses his reason to be there. And at that point, he's just a body. He's a tourist. He has to be like those people. And as a consequence, uh, he descends into, if you like, their way of seeing the world. He begins to see the world in a whole different manner. He gets lost. He nearly dies. Somebody tries to kill him. And then ultimately he goes through this enormous ritual which takes him to the beginning to of the time. To the beginning, yeah. What, how did you come across this piece and what got you thinking about turning it into this 
theatrical experience. I was given the book in 1994. Several years later, I made a piece about memory called Mnemonic. Yes, a wonderful in, piece. Right. In New York. And at that point, I became very fascinated as to what, you know, one of the last great mysteries is this one we carry inside our heads. How we remember, how we imagine, who we actually think we are. What is this curious thing about feeling conscious? Yeah? We know when we're dead, theoretically, we're not conscious. Before we're born, we're not conscious. So this thing happens to us where suddenly I am me and you are you. Uh, and we feel that this is our world. So I made this piece about memory and I realized that memory and identity had a very close relationship, but I continued to have discussions with neuroscientists and uh, all sorts of people about what consciousness is, which is more complicated than memory. Memory has a particular biochemical function, but what is consciousness? I don't know. I still can't know. You know, it's just says you, how can you talk about consciousness when you're conscious? So I became fascinated by that. And then I started to reread this book, Amazon Beaming. Yeah. And I realized that there, there was a uh, connection between the two things. And my own obsession and the telling of this story started to interlink. So if you like, the show is a kind of twinning of two stories. One is the story of Lauren McIntyre, mm -hmm. but the other is the story of me, Simon McBurney, uncovering this story and thinking about the notion of consciousness and because I have a child, realizing that the way that I'm thinking about the world, this materialistic consumer world, <laughs> is shaping my daughter's future. So a very simple mm. question, what kind of world am I leaving my daughter? What way are we thinking? Is this the best possible way? Are we being as constructive as we can about this world or are there questions that we should ask ourselves? And so just as Laura McIntyre is forced to confront the way that he sees the world, in a sense, me, the performer, I'm also confronting my own world and my responsibility to my daughter. So I should say that my daughter appears in the show. Yes, we hear her voice. People literally say they see her mm -hmm. on stage, even though she's not there. And one of the strange things is that gradually through the piece, People come up to me afterwards and say, Stranger, I, I was convinced that I saw somebody else on stage at a certain point. And this is because I use this, uh, a binaural head, which means that you hear literally in sound all around you in three dimensions. So what it does, why do I use that? Why not just do a, a play? Why not do something a little bit like The Lion King and have a lot of sort of stuff <laughs> on stage? You know? Well, puppets, puppets. because I think that the most uh, powerful tool we have is also something inside our heads, which is our imagination. Mm -hmm. For me growing up, yes, the radio was a much more visual medium than the television because I could imagine things that are not there. But by actually having it on stage and by suggesting things with light, with video, uh, with this sound, is you play a kind of magic trick on people's minds where they start to think that they see things, but with this binaural head, they are placed, you are placed, every member of the audience is placed in the center of the action. So the head is on stage, you're plugged into the head, and as I walk around it, so I am walking around you. Why do I do that? Very simply, solitude. What is it like to be totally alone, 400 miles of Amazonian jungle in every direction, just you? Mm -hmm. Now. You can sit back with your, with your audience and go, oh, yeah, well, that's an interesting, you know, there's Hamlet all alone. Gosh, he's having a tough time, you know, you say to your neighbor. But if suddenly you have the experience of solitude with your headphones mm. and you go, oh, my God, this is me. Mm. And suddenly I hear a mosquito behind me and, oh, God, I don't want to hear that. It, it, you become placed in the situation of McIntyre, which is what I want. At one point he gets... Was it maggots that are crawling all over him? What is it? Some horrible... Well, what yeah. happens, I was in the Amazon two years ago. I was going to ask you if you went to do research and I did. I was in a village with my Wuna and I told them this story. I almost wanted permission to tell the story. I said, look, this is one point of view. If you like, it's a colonial point of view. It's a white man going into your territory. But I want to tell you this story because something happens in it. They were absolutely 
fascinated and they, they were insistent that I should tell the story but also tell people that they exist and what they do. But while I was there, yes, I went into the forest and uh, uh, one of the things is that when you get wet, you get insects that go right into your feet and quite quickly they install themselves in your body yeah. and they quickly lay eggs <laughs> inside your body. Um, now, I was kind of, uh, you know, in terms of mosquito bites, I was okay. My sound uh, recordist, who I went in, had, uh, you know, more than a thousand mosquito bites oh by God. the time he came out. Um, <laughs> I don't know why, but I was kind of okay. Uh, but it is the most biodiverse place on the planet. Well, I just want to say you had me itching. Speaking of the power <laughs> of the imagination, no, I really I was want... swatting mosquitoes no, behind no, me no. in the, but, the but With the maggots in the toes, then I found myself itching, and I thought, surely <laughs> you're imagining this. So it's it, and it's so powerful. You, the actor up there, being the guy in the Amazon, because this is not just a reading you are doing quite a, a powerful and very athletic acting job. What was I, I mean, what is important for your viewers to understand is that it becomes embodied. So if you like, the theater piece becomes more and more and more real. So it mm -hmm. begins with the storytelling until I'm literally, if you like, possessed. Mm -hmm. I'm dancing. Yes. I'm covered in blood from head to foot. You're terrified about your survival. I, I am terrified about my survival. I'm confronting the idea of mortality, which is also something which disturbs us in the West very much. We go, I, I really don't want to die. You know, it's the end of time, the end of my consciousness. What's going to happen? But yet you are, you, you have become for, part of their consciousness because you yeah. don't know if you're ever getting back. Yeah, to but the also yeah. what I discovered when I was really not discover, but what I understood from my conversations with uh, the people that I was in with in the Amazon is that for them, what is inside their head is inseparable from what's outside. Mm -hmm. So the jungle is part of their mind. Mm -hmm. What they think and feel can be seen outside them. If you destroy what's outside you, you're destroying something that's within. Ah. And that, I feel, is a very profound thought because... We are part of nature. We are part of this planet. Even as we're sitting here, we feel we're in the town. We're not out with the cows and so on. No, despite the fact that we're here, we're still part of nature. And we cannot escape it, just as we cannot escape the well, planet. Well, we're not in touch with it to sustain Yeah, but we can't escape the planet. No. And we can't escape <laughs> nature. I want to ask you quickly, what has happened to the Maya Runa? Is the Maya Runa? Maya Runa, perfect, yeah. That's what has it. happened to them since 1969? And that's because now civilization has encroached on them. Did what they come to New York as tourists to see uh, the no. encounter? But, 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 you know, they, because in this story, they're totally out of touch with, with uh, you know, they're running and they're not in being encroached upon. But now what's happening, what's happening with them? They're part of a large group called the Matses in the Yavari Valley which is their homeland. There is still an area where they reckon uh, up to 50 uncontacted tribal peoples still. Oh, really? Uh, which is a lot. Yeah. In 2016, people who've never encountered white people at all. Wow. Um, it's a vast area still. Uh, and, but what is happening, of course, is that the rush for oil is just simply increasing. Mm -hmm. And until we decide that we don't need uh, oil, which we have to decide fairly soon because there are all sorts of other ways of getting electricity, uh, harnessing the power in the world, um, then unfortunately these things uh, will continue to happen. Uh, all right, the play is called The Play, The Theatrical Experience. It's brilliant, called The Encounter at the Golden Theatre, conceived by and starring Simon McBurney. Thank you very much for being our guest on Theatre Talk. Thank you for having me. Now, Susan, one of my favorite plays is Les Liaisons Dangereuses. I worked on it as a young little intern in Liz McCann's office in 1987. It is coming back in a fine new production starring Lieb Schreiber and Janet McTeer. But the man responsible for Les Liaisons Dangereuses is Christopher Hampton, who many years ago read the Laclo book, I believe. Oh, and I was a student then. That was many, many years ago. <laughs> well, welcome to, welcome to Theatre Talk. Thank you. When you read the book, did you immediately think there's a play here somewhere? What was the idea? Not at it? all, no, but I mean, I read the book and, and was staggered by it. I was about 19. 
Mm. And I thought, my God, this is... Uh, oh, I see, I understand. There were lots of things I, about sex, for example, <laughs> I, I understood for the first time reading this book. Uh, I always described it as the best sex education a boy could hope for. And then I had this sort of notion that it might make a play. And I suggested, I remember, the first time uh, in, in the mid-70s when the new theatre on the National... The Na National Theatre in London was opening in its new building. Right. And they were looking for, you know writers to provide them with material. And I said, uh, I, I'd like to adapt Les Liaisons Dangereuses. Well, it wasn't so well known, the book. There, yeah, could so. you sketch it? Because this book is from 1782. That's right. Can you so, sketch in what it is for those who might not know? Yeah, it's a, it's a book about uh, two bored, extremely rich aristocrats who amuse them, who have had an affair in the past, who amuse themselves by corrupting other people and then telling each other about it. Uh, and they at the beginning of the play, embark on a particularly complicated intrigue. And, and it turns back on them and bites them. And this novel came out before the French Revolution and was said that Marie Antoinette was supposed to be a fan of the novel. Oh, yes, yes. Catherine the Great, everybody, they all read it. But it didn't do poor old Laclos, the author, very much good because... Uh, because the scandal hurt his career a good deal. He was a career soldier. Yeah. Oh, really? And he just got into big trouble. And you didn't get royalties in those days, you know. So this book was going like Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, but it didn't do him <laughs> any good yeah. at all. But then, but then, no, because I was reading these thumbnail analyses of, of the play, uh, that they thought that the, the decadence of the story might have fueled people in their sentiments towards the upper classes when the revolution hit. Well, I think it's a very, there's actually a very interesting phenomenon, uh, and I've never quite understood what the connection was, but, but the, the predominant popular literature in in the 1770s and 1780s in France was pornographic. Mm -hmm. It was porno pornography, light pornography, heavy pornography. And there must be some connection between that and the fact that the revolution was right around the corner. Mm -hmm. Well, it didn't make sense to me. The, the upper classes would be so, so jaded that that's all they had to do was be obsessed with pornography rather than uh, and where, and where all these... Well, somebody said, about, about, somebody said about Les Liaisons Dangereuses, if you read this book, you know the society can't go on like this. Exactly, exactly. It's heading towards the edge of a cliff. Exactly, because these, these two people, they're, for human beings, for them, are just little things you play with on the board. Yeah, that's right. They're not... That's they, right. On the other hand, they're extremely charming and interesting. They're, one, they're fabulous people. You want to be... Al, I want to be Alan Rickman. This has and, been made a star of Alan Rickman and Lindsay Duncan. And you certainly production. have them saying very witty things but, and but, insightful things. But, but, but just go back for a second. When you went to the National Theater... Well, they said, said... They went off and read the book. Um, and then they said, well, no, we don't want to commission this play because um, the, two main the two main characters never meet. They just write letters to one another in the yeah, book. That's right, yeah. Uh, and I said, well, I, I had it in mind to... <laughs> <laughs> Trust the playwright, please. <laughs> uh, and they said, no, no, listen, let's find something else for you to do. <laughs> and it was a, about, I think it was another eight years before the Royal Shakespeare Company offered me an open commission. Mm. And I just um, wrote the play and handed it in. They weren't at all pleased. Really? When they got it, no. What was their complaint? They thought, what is this, you know, this old book and, you know, and I don't know whether it's going to work. And it was supposed to be for the Barbican, which was relatively new then, this thousand seat theatre that was the uh, RSC's London base. And, and um, uh, they decided to demote it to a theatre called The Other Place, which was right. essentially a tin hut and a car park <laughs> in Stratford. <laughs> and they gave it 22 performances and it, they, nobody could have been more amazed than they, I think, when it, when it found an audience. What was it like when you, Lindsay Duncan and Alan Rickman, I mean, two great, Alan became a great star, Lindsay is a great star, but they, nobody knew who they were back then. No, nobody knew who they were and the, the, the thing was that you could, you, you, your casting was dependent on uh, who was in the company. The, the, the company. Right. But at, at the right at the beginning of the casting period, you could say, and I had an instinct about Alan Rickman, and I said, can you ask Alan Rickman to join the company and play this part? And they said, yeah, yeah, okay, he can be in As You Like It, he can be in... So they offered him a line of parts, including this. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of responsible for shoehorning him into the, into <laughs> and the RSC. And then the, the other people were there already. Right. The play took off immediately. First performance, it was... It was incredible. Uh, I've never really experienced anything like it before or since. And... 
I remember going down in, in it, it only had 22 performances, and I remember going down to see it in November for a matinee, and it was snowing. And I went, you know, there's this tiny theatre in this car park, and I walked down the street, and I saw a line of people waiting for return tickets coming right out of the car park and down, down the street. In the snow. <laughs> And in the snow, and I thought, oh, I see, something, something really good is happening. I only met uh, Alan Rickman three times, but he always seemed like such a charming, genial person, and not the, the venal Valmont. I mean, he was a wonderful man, yes. and when he died, everybody knew he was a very kind man, but he was particularly kind to young actors. He mm. went out of his way to help people. Everybody had a story about how he'd been, how he'd been kind to them. And but he had this quality when he acted because then he terrifying. went Terrifying. Yes, yeah, totally. and he, then he went into <laughs> he the Die Hard villain. movie, remember, and became a star, a movie star. It was Die Hard. It was Die Hard that yes. he got because I think Joel Silver came to see him. I would imagine, I would imagine. Yeah. When you were pulling the book apart, <clears throat> what were you looking for to make it into a play? I mean, what was the key for you to take this epistolatory novel and shape it as a play? Well, listen, the plot is great. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to write a play that was like the equivalent of a page turner. Right. That you wanted, to, you desperately wanted to know what happened next. Right. Uh, and the and the plot is such a marvelous clockwork mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so satisfying. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had to then I had to find a sort of language for it. Right. And I started off. I, I had a couple of false starts. I started off writing a rather sort of uh, archaic kind of 18th century. <laughs> and I thought this is going to distance. Yeah, yeah. Then I thought I'd write something. Write it completely modern. And that didn't quite seem right either. So eventually I found a, a way of, it's very, there are a lot of very complicated sentences in it. It's very hard to learn for mm. actors. Mm. Um, but it's, it's, all the language is modern. Right. So it, it kind of feels slightly uh, uh, from another era. But it's, and, and what was very interesting about it was how, was precisely when we did it, how modern it, it suddenly felt. Mm. You know, there were these people in, these extraordinary costumes, mm -hmm. wigs and so on, and they were just like us. No, it's a tale for our times, most certainly. It was very interesting, I remember the time too, because AIDS was yes. happening. Yes. And there was a lot of conversation around yes. this kind of decadence yes. and AIDS and these It's people. really interesting if you have a, a play that kind of comes back, how r different the resonances are from one, one period to another. So in the 80s, as you say, it was, it was AIDS. It was also the me generation. It was also the bang in the middle of, of Thatcher here and Ray, exactly. uh, Thatcher in England and Reagan here, yep. uh, where people were kind of being encouraged to be selfish and, you know. <laughs> now it seems much more of a play about the 1%. Yeah, about, <laughs> that's right. Very true. About these incredible, these, Back to there the are a Revolution. few people, yeah. who there are very, very few people with a massive amount of Right. Time and money. Time and money. Who could do whatever they damn well please with exactly. no repercussions. Exactly. <laughs> the structure of this, this drama also is, is, is so compelling. As you say, it's a great plot and also the way you put it together. And I have to say in this play, there's one of the most devastating scenes that I've ever seen in a play. It's the end of Act One. That when I saw it performed, it, it made me very uncomfortable and upset. And I read the play again yesterday and it made me uncomfortable and upset all over again just to to read that scene. Did you understand what the impact of that scene would be as you were writing it, or uh, did that... Yes, I think so, and I think that, 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 that you, have to, you have to do a couple of things in, in, in this kind of story. First of all, you have to, what they do is they seduce the audience, mm -hmm. yes. right? Mm -hmm. the t those two characters, and you think, my God, these people are really glamorous and right. intelligent mm -hmm. and witty. But then you have to then they start doing things that are really uncomfortable. And brutal, yeah. And brutal. And, and so, you, you know, on a good night, you feel, the audience, you feel the audience sort of shifting during that scene. You no, know, it always reminded me a bit of All About Eve with the verbal felicity, the way the George Sanders character can um, make um, um, Eve Harrington submit well, it's very funny you should ask me that because I have actually done a. Oh, you've done stage an adaptation, uh, right? I forgot about that. Of yes. all about Eve, but I think you might not be seeing it because. Uh, Why? Uh, because I think um, I think what's been decided is that Eva Van Hove is going to do his own version of it. <laughs> of all, <laughs> is he going to? You, not your not your script. Not He's my, gonna, not my script. No. Seriously, but you would have been yeah. perfect for that because I do remember <laughs> thinking. <laughs> George, <laughs> <laughs> Can, you know, he's a, I have great admiration for Eva Van. He's not famous for his sense of humor. But. No, 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 no. In fact, when I did when I did the, the, the adaptation first, it was a, a, three or four years ago. It didn't happen because there, because there were then 
legal problems came out of the woodwork about the rights and so on. So the whole all thing, about Eve. All about Eve. So the oh, whole thing think, went yeah. into suspension for, yeah. a, for a minute. Right. Uh, and, but in the meantime, we'd had this reading, and Alan Rickman did. <gasps> he played uh, George. Oh he, he did Alison DeWitt, and Chris and Scott Thomas played, uh, played Margot Channing, and Felicity Jones played uh, Eve. And it was the most yeah. magical afternoon. And the way I'd adapted it was I, I kind of made, um, uh, I made, I make him the narrator. So he recruits the audience on his side. It's a pretty much the same trick, actually. He recruits the audience on his side, and then you realize what a terrible man he is. <laughs> Those are the best parts, though, I think. But not, but not as terrible as Valmont. Oh, not as terrible no, as no, Valmont. No. I think that's a perfect part for Liev Schreiber. I think he has that ability yes. to, to inc- charm you and then terrify you. I'm really impressed with him. All right, uh, Les Liaisons Dangereuses is going to be at the Booth Theater, starring Liev Schreiber and Janet McTeer. Terrific play, adapted, really, really written by. We written, say by. written by. Yeah. <laughs> written. You always get adaption credits, and I think, I think, I think that adaption is a, is a nice word for saying, Chris, take somebody else's thing and totally rewrote it. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll give a little credit to, what's his name again? La Clo. Yes, La Clo. <laughs> Poor fellow. <laughs> That's right. No royalties, all yours. <laughs> Christopher Hampton, thanks for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Good luck with Les Liaisons Dangereuses. Thank you very much. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Freeze, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you.